and that the world would see that because they see you in us. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Before I start preaching this morning, you know, sometimes whenever I start calling out names of who's on what camera and this, that, and the other, I get down and I realize, oh my goodness, I've totally forgotten to, to mention uh, a name. And so there's two names I think that I missed in the course of that. And I know that they wouldn't care a, a bit about the credit because nobody is seeking that. But I just have been so appreciative of, of the whole team. I mean, not, not, to, not to try to point out only the young people, but uh, I don't think I mentioned my daughter Kylie, who's on the, the camera back there. Did I mention her whenever I was going through? Did I mention her? All right. Well, Gabe, this is the first week that Gabe hasn't had a specific responsibility. The poor guy has to wake up at like 6.30 in the morning because Jeremy insists on being here so early. And so every single week, uh, and we're going back, like you guys see them now. And so what Gabe was actually doing is through rehearsal, he was training on this camera uh, right over here where Dawson is. And now he's just sitting, sitting in the back there, the first week that he hasn't been on something. And, um, and so I wanted to make sure I said thank you to you as well, Gabe. Uh, so, so good job. He's been here. Actually, this whole team of young people, like, go way back before we ever started meeting together. Every week whenever we were in here filming, they were here as well. Uh, and I should probably also throw Kylie Young, who was on keys uh, this morning, because uh, she's a young person. She was in here time and time again. These guys, I, I just love the way that they serve. And we as adults uh, can learn a lot from their hearts. Not that, uh, not that the adults don't serve well. Uh, the adults certainly do. Uh, but I've really appreciated the young people. Parents, uh, if you're a parent of one of these students, uh, you've done a nice job, a really, really nice job. So uh, I just wanted to say that before, and I probably still forgot someone. I'm, I'm one of those people, I'm like, who did I forget, who did I forget? And Gabe, you immediately popped in my mind. I'm like, oh my goodness, the, the young man has served so faithfully, and uh, I wanted to make sure I point you out and say, say thank you. Well, this morning we continue our study of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and by now you probably know we're in the book of Matthew, and if you've been following along, we're in Matthew chapter number 6. And we're going to get to a familiar passage of scripture. I think uh, most of us are well acquainted with the words that we're going to read today. So again, if you have your Bibles, and you know I, I want you to bring your Bible every single week, because what we're going to do is we're going to open the pages of God's Word, and we are going to read from them, and we are going to study them, and we are going to seek to learn from the Lord. Okay, this is not uh, time to learn from Pastor Dave Hour or anything like that. We want to look into God's Word. We want to allow Him to teach us. I love it whenever you, I mean, I'm not knocking anybody that uses a digital Bible. I love it when you bring a paper Bible just because it gives you the opportunity to underline things, write in your Bible, you can look back and you can be like, oh yeah, that's really cool. I mean, if you would look now, obviously I've been preaching through it, but if you would look through uh, my Bible, like you can see all the blue that's kind of written on the sides and things that are underlined and things that are circled and things like, and it's just when I look back, I'm like, oh yeah, okay. I remember having that thought and it's, it's just nice to be able to be brought back to that. So again, I always encourage you to bring your Bible. We're in Matthew chapter number 6. We're going to start in verse number 19. Verse 19 says this. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in. And steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Again, a, a pretty familiar passage of scripture. Now, a lot of times when this is taught, it is taught somebody, a, a pastor will just say, Hey, open up your Bibles, Matthew chapter number six. We're going to read verses 19 through 24. And you don't have the context of those first 18 verses. But for the last three weeks, we have been looking at the first 18 verses. And so I don't want you to forget those first 18 verses. In fact, if you still have your Bibles open, go back to Matthew 6, 1. And just remind yourself of what is in Matthew 6, 1. In Matthew 6, 1, we read these words. And I'm not going to put them on the screen for you. But it says, be careful 
not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen of them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So don't do the things that you're supposed to be doing for God in order to draw attention to yourself. As we said a few Sundays ago, while Christians are to be seen doing good works, people ought to see that you are doing good works, that you are out loving on people, that you are serving God. We're supposed to be seen doing those things. We're not supposed to do good works only to be seen. So like, okay, I think somebody's watching, so I will do. If, if, if someone watching is what drives your good deeds, you have it backwards. Your love for the Lord, your desire to honor Him should drive your good deeds, and others will see that in the process. Do you see the difference there? Make sure that whenever you're doing your good works, your good deeds, make sure that as you do those good deeds, you are doing them with the mindset and the heart that says, I want to honor God. I want to honor God, and that's why I give. I want to honor God, and that's why I pray. I want to honor God, and that's why I fast. Jesus says, if you do the things just to be seen of people, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. He then elaborates, and he says, if you announce your giving to the needy, you already have your reward in full. And you can see this again, beginning of Matthew chapter number 6. If you're saying, hey, yo, look at me. Look at what I'm doing. Look at how I'm giving to the needy. Look at how I'm taking care of people. I'm such a wonderful person. You've already got your reward. That's your full reward. He follows that up by saying, if you give in secret... If you give in such a way that you're seeking to live out God's command to love him and love others, you know what? Then your heavenly father will reward you. He says the same thing about prayer and fasting. Each time you're doing it for a show, you already have your reward. But if you do it to honor God, then God will reward you later. And it's almost impossible to miss the teaching that you have two options. Rewards now or rewards later, right? I mean, you can't read the first 18 verses and not come to that pretty clear conclusion. And it kind of looks like this. It kind of looks like this. To be seen, if that's why you're doing things, that equals getting your rewards now. If you're doing it to honor God, that equals rewards in heaven. So you, you get this pretty clear picture, and I'll go even one step further to tie it in with what we just read. To be seen, if that's why you're doing things, that means rewards now. In other words, that means treasures on earth. Okay, because you can't escape that this context, this conversation about treasures on earth versus treasures in heaven takes place right after Jesus says, hey, you can already have your reward. Or you can get a reward later. Now, the opposite of that is if you're doing it to honor God, then you get your reward in heaven. In other words, treasures in heaven. So it brings us right to where we are this morning. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Just don't do it. So don't do all of these things which you should be doing. Don't be doing them with the motive of like, I want to be seen, because if so... You already have your reward, you get treasures on earth, and the Lord says, don't store up for yourself treasures on earth. Now he transitions from understanding, you know what, you can get your treasures on earth by doing these good deeds only to be seen, so you can get treasures that way, but then he transitions into saying, well, let's talk about your physical treasures. Let's talk about those as well. And so whenever we're talking about getting treasures or getting compliments or getting praise, you can get that reward now or you can get it in heaven. He's not presenting two equal options. He's just not. Jesus isn't saying, hey, there's two really good options here. You can either get your treasures now, you can get your rewards now, or you can get your rewards later. He isn't presenting two equal options. He's saying there is one greater option and there is one clearly lesser option. Please choose the greater of the two options. 
Get your treasures later. Store up for yourselves treasures, rewards in heaven. Honor God in all that you do. If you do these things to honor God, you will get those treasures in heaven. Now the thing is, is that we like immediate results. We like immediate results. I can't tell you the number of advertisements that I see talking about get-rich-quick schemes. It's amazing. Like, hey, invest in this stock and triple your money in three days. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, that's probably, probably going to work. Okay, but, but like there's this, there's this draw to people of immediate results. I want to see it happen now. I want to be able to get it now. And so sometimes we have a difficult time developing an eternal perspective. But Jesus wants to bring us right back to it. And he wants us to understand and to know, listen, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Don't do it. Why? Moth and rust, they can destroy. So whether you have, let's say, a great wardrobe, and when it talks about a moth getting there and being able to destroy, or let's say in today's context that you have valuable cars. What happens whenever you just let them sit and you don't take care of them? Rust starts to eat away at them. You leave a vehicle sit outside for any amount of time. You leave anything sit outside that's metal for any amount of time. What is it going to do? It's going to start to rust. And what happens when it rusts? It loses value. It's not like jeans. It used to be that when jeans got holes in them, you had to figure out a way to fix it. Now when jeans get holes in them, you just created a whole new product and increased their value. Cars aren't like that. Oh, hey, you got a great rust spot there. Love to see that. Thank you. You don't see somebody advertising on Facebook Marketplace or on Craigslist saying, hey, great vehicle, rusted all over. Rusted frame, rusted body, rusted rims. Come get this rust, $5,000. You just don't see that. Why? Because rust destroys. And so Jesus is saying, listen, don't do it. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. And you know what else can happen? Thieves can break in and steal. I mean, that would never happen in today's world, of course. Nobody would throw something through a window, go in and take things out. Nobody would uh, loot and riot and destroy. Nobody would do that these days. But back then, it might have taken place. Okay? No, but I mean, we understand that we could have all of these valuable possessions. And if that's what you have wrapped yourself up in, they can be gone in an instant. 2008. Pretty familiar to most adults uh, in this room, where we had uh, a time where a lot of people lost their jobs and a lot of the housing market just kind of crashed in a lot of ways. And there was a lot of foreclosure and a lot of people who thought they could afford a certain house ended up losing that house. And if that's what all your treasure is wrapped up in, if that's where you have decided, you know what, I'm going to lay up for myself treasures here on earth, that's going to be what's most valuable to me, then you know what, a lot of people came to realize it can be gone just like that. But Jesus says, you know what, there's another option. Instead of doing that, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy they don't lose value. They don't depreciate. Thieves don't break in and steal. And then Jesus goes on to wrap it up by saying, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Here recently, I don't know if any, how many of you heard the news of this treasure that was buried in the Rocky Mountains finally having been found. Anybody hear about that report? Uh, up to five people lost their life searching for this treasure. Uh, trying to find a treasure. This man said that he had hidden a treasure in the Rocky Mountains. He had written a poem that would describe how to find it. And up to five people, some people dispute whether it's four people who died or five people who died in pursuit of this treasure. They put their whole heart into it. 
And I was reading an article this week about that because they just, it's just been within the last month uh, that it's come out. Now, the thing is, is that there haven't been any pictures, uh, at least none that I can find, of, of the person who found this treasure. Uh, there hasn't been any, like, legitimate, co like, confirmation other than the guy who hit it said it's been found. And uh, it's just, it's, it's hard to tell, but... When I was reading this article, there were these people being interviewed, and they're like, I've wrapped my whole life up in finding this treasure. I don't know what I'm going to do now. And I don't even know if I want to know where it was, because if I find out that I was close, I'm going to be really upset with myself. And if I find out that I was never close, I'm going to, once again, question, how did I get this poem so wrong? But some people, they wrap their heart into this into earthly treasure. The meaning of this passage is abundantly obvious. And honestly, I think I could pull out any one of you from the congregation this morning. You could come up to this platform and you could teach the general concept of this message. I think you could. It's not hard to understand. Especially since here at Northwinds, we have made it one of our enduring themes Something that we talk about all the time, that we must live with an eternal perspective. I know that's the first time you've ever heard that uh, in, this, in this building. No, like that's one of our enduring themes. It's like, wow, the Bible talks about that here, and it talks about that here, and it talks about that here. And everywhere we go in the Bible, there's this consistent theme. We must have an eternal perspective. In fact, say it with me. Say, everybody say eternal perspective. That's what we need to live with, but it is not a natural perspective. We, we have to understand that. Like, some people think, okay, well, I'm a Christian, so I automatically have an eternal perspective. No. No, this is the transforming and the renewing of our minds, talked about in Romans chapter number 12, that must take place. It is most natural to have an earthly, a temporary perspective. It is normal to see the news. It is normal to see uh, the rising numbers of coronavirus cases. It is normal to see those things and to have a level of fear. What is the only thing that changes that? An eternal perspective. An eternal perspective. Well, some of you would say, well, a deeper look at the data. That will change your perspective, right? I don't disagree, um, but that's a totally different conversation. Whether the data would say one thing or another, an eternal perspective says this. All this stuff on the earth, it's going to eventually be gone anyway. All the things that we wrap ourselves into, we've got it backwards. Once our eternity is taken care of, once that is settled and secure, you know what? Jesus isn't going to let us down there. Our eternity is secure if you've trusted in Jesus as your Savior, and that's what ultimately matters the most. So this passage screams eternal perspective. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. That's verse 19. But instead, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. That's verse 20. And by the way, verse 21, here's the deal. Uh, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, and your heart should be to honor God. So Jesus doesn't pull out any punches here. He's not making a case that's difficult or challenging to understand from an intellectual perspective. But just because something is easy or simple to grasp intellectually does not mean that it's easy to practice or to implement practically. What Jesus is saying here is this, I want you to go against every instinct that you have. I want you to go against every instinct of your body. Every instinct that we have says, my greatest need is a physical need. My greatest need is an emotional need. My greatest need is a, is a relational need. My greatest need is a financial need. My greatest need is an intellectual need. My greatest need is a security need. My greatest need is a health need. My greatest need is, and you can just kind of fill in that blank, but every fiber of our being screams out to us day after day after day, 
Your greatest need is physical. Your greatest need is intellectual. Your greatest need is social. Your greatest need is, and you just feel in that, it screams out day after day after day after day. And we hear again, you got to take care of yourself. You got to take care of yourself. It's all about you. It's all about you. You got to make sure that you're taken care of. And what are you doing to take care of yourself? And, and God's word screams out, have a different perspective. It's not natural. Stop thinking that the things of God are natural. Stop thinking that the things of God will just come to you automatically. Stop thinking that the things of God in the mind of God is something that just happens because you walk into a church on a Sunday. No, these are things that must be developed by time with God, study of his word, and complete submission to his will. Okay, God, I will allow you to transform my thinking. We live in a time when nobody wants their thinking challenged. We live in a time when you can find someone, boom, like that, go on social media. You can skip the people that have different thoughts than you, and you can like the people that have thoughts that are the same as you. We live in a time that is like that. If you don't want to be challenged in your thinking, you can find plenty of people who think exactly like you. I can do it too. I have a favorite journalist. I do. He thinks like me, I think. At least he says things that I think. And so I have the tendency to kind of like this guy. And so if I'm going to look for information, I'll go to him. And I'm, not, I'm intentionally not saying his name. Okay, because you could quickly find this guy too. Some of you, I've talked to you about this guy, but we don't like to have our thinking challenged, but everything about this passage says you must change the way that you're thinking. Stop thinking only about the things that are around you. Stop thinking about only earthly things. Stop thinking only, uh, only focus on earthly treasures. Now, here's the thing. When we perceive that any one of our physical needs, emotional needs, intellectual needs, uh, financial needs, health needs, when we perceive that they are challenged, do you know what we do? We have a tendency to become even, even more focused on those things. How does hoarding come about? Believe it or not, there was an entire segment of our population that hoarded toilet paper only a few months ago. It's a true story. You guys know it's true. Some of you tried to find toilet paper and couldn't. Those who legitimately needed it had a hard time finding it. Why? Because some people perceived, and I don't even know where we got this perception, because a symptom of the virus has nothing to do uh, with that. And, and I'm thinking, like, how did all of a sudden we decide that toilet paper had to be hoarded? Well, some people somewhere decided, you know what, you might have a shortage of toilet paper. And so what did people do? Oh, my goodness, I got I to gotta have toilet paper. Store up for yourselves toilet paper on earth. Thank you. Somebody's listening. When it was announced a little bit later that there might be a meat shortage, what did people do? Well, I got to find meat. Somebody said we might have a meat shortage. All right, well, I got to get meat. I got to store up for meat for myself. And along comes Jesus. And imagine that he preaches this message. To us during this time, and he says, don't store up for yourselves toilet paper that may get soggy and ruined. Don't store up for yourselves meat that could get spoiled. Don't store up for yourselves, and you just kind of fill in that blank. Don't make that your focus. And notice that Jesus is very intentional in saying, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. There's a clear inward focus here. That Jesus is warning against. It's an all about me mentality. Not caring for my neighbor. Not loving my neighbor. Not helping to make sure that my neighbor's needs are taken care of. And, and satisfied and supported. It's all about me. And it goes completely against Jesus' command. To love God and love others. Now a caution for a moment. Because some people will take this to an extreme. This passage does not, nor does God's word in any place, teach against the wisdom of preparation. It's not what this passage is talking about. It's not saying, hey, I don't want you to, I don't want you to be prepared. No, what's Proverbs say? Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. 
She stores up for herself. Like, it's not saying, listen, I, 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 don't, want you to, I don't want you to be prepared, but don't make life about an inward and self-focus. Don't store up for yourselves these treasures. It's the all about me mentality that we mentioned just a mo moment ago. Here's the crazy thing. When looking at this passage, I would imagine most of you are sitting there thinking, this one doesn't even really apply to me. I'm not rich. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Oh, you know what? I don't have an abundance of wealth. I don't have an abundance of this. I think the majority of Christians, and this is typical of how we view the Bible, we think, well, this applies to someone else. This is, a, this is a passage for those who have an abundance of wealth. It's for the rich. But let me ask you, just to think more intentionally for just a minute. Think back to the beginning of chapter 6. Do Jesus' challenges about giving, do they apply to you? Do his challenges about prayer, do they apply to you? Do his challenges about fasting, do they apply to you? Do you have to guard against self Focus? I don't think any of us would be able to say, you know what, I simple. Never think about myself. Now, some people have a natural, it, more outward focus because they have submitted to God leading in their life. And so it's just, it's a part of who they are now. And that's a wonderful thing. But for the most part, people are like, okay, take care of me. Take care of my family. Take care of my friends. Take care of me, me, me. And it's this all about self mentality so we have to guard against that and we have to look at where we are in life and we have to guard against the mindset that says i'm going to store things up for myself check out what paul says to the ephesians I, I love this because even those who let's say don't have much paul says this he says in in ephesians 4 28 he who has been stealing must steal no longer but he must work why doing something useful with his own hands so that he may have something to share with those in need. If you don't have anything, you know what the Lord says to do? Here's what he says. He said, you know what? You need to, you need to start working. You need to start working. Why? To, to, hoard up, to, to save up for yourself? To take care of yourself? All about me? No, he said... The, the, the clear indication, the clear teaching, so that you can have something to share. An outward focus. An outward focus. If you only have an inward focus, you're going to find yourself, I think on a pretty frequent basis, being slightly depressed. Maybe majorly depressed. You, you, all you see is yourself, and, and honestly, depending on, on what time period you're living through, I mean, in your life, in society, if all you see is yourself, like, oh, man, things aren't going so well with me. You know what? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing well myself. And Jesus says, tell you what, got a different idea. Instead of having this all about me mentality, let's switch that around. Let's start to have an eternal perspective. And when you start to have the mind of God, the mind of God that has love and compassion for your neighbor, mercy and forgiveness for those who have wronged you, strength for each day, more than a conqueror that we sang earlier, when you start to see that from an eternal perspective, then God starts to change how you see things. And that's the very next transition. Because if you just read verse 22, if you just get to the point of reading verse 22, and you read verses 22 and 23, and let's read them together, they immediately make no sense, at least to me. Verse 22. The eye is the lamp. This, this sounds philosophic, philosophical. The eye is the lamp of the body. Your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. Verse 23, but if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Doesn't that sound philosophical? That sounds like some deep thinking right there. 
And I'm not saying that Jesus isn't encouraging us to think deeply, but this isn't nearly as philosophical as what we might originally read it and think. I had a meeting at some point this week. I lose track of my days, but I had a meeting here in the back with, uh, with a couple of gentlemen, and, uh, and, and as we, it was Thursday. I remember the band was out here. They were rehearsing. And um, as we were meeting, I was, I was trying to process this. I'm like, man, oh, man, I tell you, I'm studying through this. I'm like, it's weird because it says the eye is the lamp of the body, and you kind of get this, this picture that your eye kind of turns around and projects inside. I don't fully understand all the ways in which the eye works. It's amazing that you kind of think about your eye seeing something out there, but your eye is actually projecting it inside. So it's looking out, but sending in. And like, how in the world does it do all of that? But Jesus comes along and says, you know what? The eye is the lamp or the projector for the body. Therefore, if your eye is good, if your projector is good, you're going to be full of light. But if your eyes are bad and your projector is bad, you're going to be full of darkness. And how dark would that be if your projector is projecting darkness? And you're still like, I don't get it. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. I, I had to process this over. But it really comes down to something pretty simple. Verses 1 through 18 are talking about motives, right? And, and listen, you, you have two options here. You can either get your reward now or you can get it later. A good perspective would say, okay, the eternal rewards are of immensely greater value. Your perspective, how you see things, how you perceive life, it would lead you to say, okay, I'm going to have this eternal focus. Jesus then says, I tell you what, as it relates to your possessions, think about this. Store up for yourselves treasures, possessions in heaven. Don't worry about storing up for yourselves treasures on earth because they will go away. Now, if you see things differently, that's basically what Jesus follows. If you see things differently, your life is going to be full of darkness. However, if your eyes are good and you are seeing things from this eternal perspective and it's shining that light inside, how great is it to have a heart and a life that's filled with light? You've met some people like this. You've met some people who as they see life, they can find good in the darkest of places. When they see things, they see, wow, you know what? It might look like this, but I bet you God's working behind the scenes. I bet you God's working in, the, in a person's heart to bring about good. I mean, uh, in our community, terrible tragedy within the last week, week and a half, uh, a firefighter who, who lost his life, uh, not in the course of fighting a fire, but actually as a result of, of a fire in like our community hurts. And, and we mourn for, for the DeVore family and, and like to, to lose someone that you love, a friend, a, a relative, a, a person in the community who's, who has such an impact and, and has, has given a, a good portion of his life to, to being a, a, a fireman and serving others. And, and you look and you just hurt. But, and, okay, so how does your eye work? Does your eye see that and see only, only terrible tragedy? Or can you see that God can work through the darkest of circumstances to bring about good because you have an eternal perspective? I mourn with those who mourn, and it hurts to lose someone from the community. It does. But I can't avoid the perspective that says, God, how are you going to bring something good out of this? God, how are you going to glorify your name even through the midst of this? God, how are you going to do something that I could never think of doing? God, how can you bring about joy in the midst of sadness? How, God, can you do that? And that's the perspective that we need to allow to be projected into our minds and into our hearts. Allow your eye to be good. Train your eye to be good. Whatever things are pure and lovely, whatever things are a good report, whatever things are true, Think on these things. Your eye, I want you to think about just this last week. I want you to think about this just this last week. 
What was projected into your heart? What was projected into your life? Was it darkness, doom, and gloom? You can find it. Oh, it's easy. It's easy to have a, a, a temporary perspective that says, wow, it looks like this. And I mean, our family, and in just a few weeks, we plan to go on vacation. It would be easy to look and say, okay, it looks like, you know, things are rising around the country and they're shutting down things in this state. They're shutting down beaches in this state. Oh, my goodness, what's going to happen? You know, it's easy to allow this projection inside because it's everywhere. Doom and gloom. However, Jesus says, you know what? The eye is the lamp of the body, and if your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. What are you focusing on? What are you allowing to be projected into your heart and your mind? Do you wake up every day? Oh, my goodness, it's another day. Oh, what's well, going to go wrong today? Oh, I don't know if I'll be able to make it today. I don't know. Like, and, and I know that some people struggle with that, and I'm not in any way trying to minimize that struggle. But what we see here is that you have the opportunity to allow to be projected within you what you will focus on. Focus on your difficulties, you're going to project darkness. Focus on the hope of Jesus Christ, and you're going to project darkness light focus on anger and you're going to project darkness focus on joy and love and compassion and mercy and you're going to project light you can change your focus early on through all of this you know what i told many of you to do i think i even sent out an email turn off the news get off of social media and listen to christian music turn off the news Get off social media and listen to Christian music. Why? Because your heart and your mind needs to project light. And Jesus says this, like, listen, hey, I've just finished telling you. Have this perspective. It's an eternal perspective. Now, listen, if you let in all these earthly perspectives, you're going to be full of darkness and how great that darkness is. I have said over and over, I do not know how people do it without Jesus. I don't consider Jesus a crutch. <laughs> I consider him my legs. Like he's not someone that I lean on just to get by. He's someone that I can't function. I don't know how people face difficulty. I don't know how they face uh, opportunities in life, you know, life changes and societal changes. I don't know how they face those without the light of Jesus being projected inside. So let me challenge you as Jesus challenges you. Consider what you're projecting into yourself. Are you projecting light or are you projecting darkness? Because if you're projecting darkness, as Jesus says, how great is that darkness? Allow the light and the love of Jesus to, to come through. Well, the last verse says this. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You just can't do it. You cannot say, my whole focus is going to be on storing up for myself. I'm going to have a I'm the one who matters mentality and I'm going to live that lifestyle and I'm going to make sure that I'm taken care of, my family's taken care of, my friends are taken care of and nobody else matters. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth because they can be gone in an instant. Don't serve money and try to serve God at the same time. What Jesus is clearly saying here is this. Just sell yourself out to God. Don't try to serve two things. Sell yourself out to God and watch the way that he projects light into your life. Watch the way that he projects light into dark circumstances. Watch the way that he takes care of you eternally. Let him do that. So I want you to think about just a couple of things. Where is your treasure? Where's your treasure? You're storing up treasure somewhere. 
Where is yours? If I was to find your treasure right now, if the Lord was to give me this divine treasure map, and I was to follow it, would I have to make it into heaven to find your treasure? Or could I find your treasure in your driveway, in your house, in your bank account, in the security of your job? Where would I find your treasure? Allow God to change your perspective Allow his light to shine in, even in dark circumstances, and make all the difference in the world. Serve only him. Father, thank you for your word. Thanks for the clear challenge of it. I pray that no one walks out of this place today not understanding the clarity of your word, which is that it's oh so natural to focus on earthly things, to store up for, for ourselves treasures here on earth, to live with an all-about-me mentality. It's so easy to do that, and it's so natural because that's kind of the way that we have learned from the rest of society, but you come into our lives, and you come into our circumstances, and you come into this very day, and you say, people, children of God, my brothers and sisters, allow me to change your perspective. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You know what? They can't be touched. They will be there waiting for you. In your eyes, let the light and the love and the compassion and the mercy of Jesus be what gets projected into your heart and your mind and your soul. Because if the light is darkness, oh my goodness, how dark that is. But if the light is the Son of God, and it projects inside of us. You project inside of us how bright our hearts will be. Lord, help us to live this out this very week. We submit ourselves to you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to sing a closing song.